Now, with today's close, global stocks have gained for a sixth consecutive trading session, despite unsettling events around the world. So is this a sign that the economy and investors are impervious to unforeseen events? My next guest, Jim Moffat, fund manager at Scout International Fund, he has some answers, perhaps. He's optimistic about the U.S. economy, and his fund has $8 billion under management and has outperformed 91 percent of its peers year to date. Now, also with us, we're joined by our senior market correspondent, Julie Hyman. Great to have you with us, Julie. Jim, great to be great. with you. So what is this? Markets just grind higher, climb the wall of worry, proverbially. But it seems as though in actuality, that's what's happening. People shrugging off bad news. And some of it, I think they get desensitized. I mean, like Portugal and the, the, the debt crisis. Uh, we've been hearing about that since last summer. It's not new in a sense. Uh, uh, even Libya and stuff, I mean, that kind of rolls along. It gets a little old. Uh, Japan was a little more of a jolt. Uh, it went down. Now it seems it's working its way back up. Uh, uh, you know, it'll, it'll work out eventually. Japan's got, obviously, some serious problems there. And as you mentioned, nuclear power is one of them. Uh, uh, but as a, in a sense, the market's been kind of desensitized to the bad news. And there's... There's, from our point of view, there's a world of money out there that is getting tired of uh, zip on their interest rates. That's the technical term for nothing, right? <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Well, I know that one of your biggest holdings in the fund, Komatsu, uh, the Japanese construction uh, firm, uh, is that the kind of stock that you would want to be buying more of if indeed you saw that the market was going to sell off even more in Japan? Because we saw that it did sell off, but then it came back. Right. Komatsu is the kind that, well, we've got enough of it. We like it. Uh, we're looking at things like Woodside Petroleum. That, uh, in Australia? Uh, that Australia, they've got increasing production coming on stream, and uh, they're in the LNG business, which Japan now needs to replace their nuclear power. Uh, they need gas-fired power. So uh, given all of these shocks that we're talking about around the world, I mean, that's a company that also might benefit as the oil price is going up. And it's interesting because of all the uh, events, if you will, that the markets become desensitized to, it seems like oil would have the most capability to have a big effect here in the U.S. and as well as on the global economy. So do you play that by trying to look at things that actually benefit from a higher oil price? Well, we have some, and one of the stocks that we own is Canadian Natural Gas, uh, and our criteria there is not is, is rising production, but and obviously we're happy to see higher prices, but it's also that it's secure production, it's non-Middle East production. Uh, we think there, there are risks, obviously, in the Middle East, and uh, uh, we just as soon minimize those and take advantage of them, in a sense. Jim, as the manager of the International Fund, what are you hearing from customers when you go and you try to you know, explain to them the opportunities of overseas investments? Because you've got investments from LVMH, Moet Hennessy, luxury goods maker, as well as beverage and beer companies in Latin America, as well as, as you described, you know, construction companies in Japan, do they get the notion that growth overseas is going to continue, or are they starting to look at the United States and say, wait a minute, the U.S. economy not doing too poorly, maybe I'm not going to go with that, that theme of overseas investing. Well, what are you hearing? There's a, there's a third area, and that's the, the, the Orient, China, and uh, the emerging markets. And they're trying to sl their policies are trying to slow their economies down because they're growing too fast. And we think that the U.S. is in, well, in many ways offset it. Uh, Europe is in some ways, uh, it's a mixed bag, and we've, Europe is not one homogenous area. There's Portugal at one extreme, and Greece, uh, Ireland, uh, but there's Germany and Sweden that are making things and prospering. Uh, uh, so we think Europe is in some ways in the same boat as the United States, I mean, the good parts of Europe. And part of a strategy is also to, is issue selection. I mean, the, trying to pick the right companies that are going to prosper in this environment. Uh, uh, I won't say, I mean, we worry about the, the top-down part of it, but on the other hand, we, we can think we can take advantage on the bottoms up of buying the right stocks. Invest, so. Investors a little bit more uh, opportunistic now? Right. Yeah? Yeah. They're willing to spend a little money in the stock market? I think so. And yeah, I think that, as I said, they're getting tired of not making much money uh, in the alternatives. Sort of, sort of to, to Pim's point here, when you look at the, the uh, Asia-Pacific area, and as you say, they're trying to slow growth down, their rates are going up in a lot of these areas, is that making your, your clients nervous at all? 
I don't think so. I mean, the, they still think that the growth is going to keep on going enough to fuel right, some of the, right. the the companies there. And you know, we run we run a balanced portfolio. Where we're not making big China bets or making big. South African bets or, or wherever we try, as you pointed out, you know, we've got a little French luxury, we've got a little Japanese construction, a little Brazilian beer, uh, we, we try to keep a balance of it. Sounds like a good night but, out. Right. <laughs> Indeed. I want to thank you very much. Uh, Jim Moffat, a Scout International, appreciate your thoughts and insights. And Julie Hyman from our Markets Desk, as always, appreciate your contribution.